attached to Stonehenge. It was part of an international culture of stone worship, much of whose meaning we don't yet know. What did stones mean to these people? The Celts, the Mayans, the Egyptians? Certainly they were animate. They had divinity. They linked with the larger cosmos, the cycle of the year, the movement of sun and planets. What we do know is that the people who used them and worshipped them and with them had advanced learning. They had Pythagorean mathematics before Pythagoras, a complex astronomy, advanced building techniques, and a complicated language. The language is lost. There are carved symbols on the stones that mystify us, yet a language is the very heart of a culture. Only then can we start to know its relationships, its beliefs, the connections it made. And who were these people? How did they live? And how and what did they communicate? What are you doing, Vanessa? What is it, Vanessa? I don't know, Mummy. Did you have a bad dream? I don't know. Come on. You better go back to bed. <laughs> She all right? She must have had a bad dream. What did she do that for? Has somebody been fiddling with this? I don't suppose so. Well, I didn't leave it like this. Daddy, come on, watch me swing it. Quiet, Vanessa. Neglected and lost. Neglected and lost. The lost language. It was William Stukeley who invented the Druids who had the most interesting theory. The Druids' power, he said, came from the most precious of all possessions, the alphabet. And where did it come from? Stukeley says, Hercules. This our Hercules learned of Abraham the East, and this he brought with him to the extremest West in the very early age of the world. And why was that wonderful? Because language was the secret of the gods. This was not the first time the mystical alphabet had been associated with Stonehenge. Now, if we turn to a quainter source, we will find that the... Where is it? Who's taking my book? Which particular book, Nicholas? You well, it's the one I'm reading. Lot. One I'm reading for the one I'm writing. Stonehenge. Stonehenge Defendi by a scholar antiquary. Where did you put it? Well, if I knew that, I wouldn't ask you, would I? Someone's moved it. Vanessa, have you taken Daddy's book? No, Mummy. Oh, of course you haven't. It hasn't been taken. Look again. It'll be there. Well, it's here. Who put it here? Vanessa, have you been... No, Daddy. You did, didn't you? No, I didn't. Mysteries associated with Stonehenge. This source declares... Now, this source proposes... The th Who's that? 
I don't know. I haven't answered it yet. Nicholas Reeve. Oh, yes, master. Oh, the master. No, not at all. I was, um, well, you know, just working. <laughs> well, I'd arranged to dine at home. You are. There's a joint in the oven. Anne says there's a joint in the oven. <laughs> Who wants to meet me? Harvey Fenton Jones. Oh, yes, I know. Yes, we were junior fellows at All Souls together back in the 60s. They just made him first minister of tourism. Yes, Anne's just reminding me. How one's friends prosper while one just goes on. <laughs> well, if it's a summons from on high, one can't refuse. Ask him here. They want us to consult us about a project or something. Here. No, Anne won't mind. Yes, I'll give her your apologies. Right? Eight o'clock. Yes, I'll be there. Bye. I'm sorry, darling. He's the master's guest. He wants to talk to us about something or other. So, once again, I stay in while you dine with dear old Harvey. Well, it'll be an appalling meal, and I've no great fondness for dear old Harvey. No, he was fond of me. Yes, I remember. You were of him. At least he was go-ahead. Fashionable at Oxford that year. Go-ahead. If it had been romantic poetry, Harvey would have had TB. You're jealous. No. Is there a clean white shirt? Seek and ye shall find. Don't touch my books. Okay, bye. Mum, will dinner be long? I'm hungry. I'm angry. Who is it? He's an old flame. Harvey Fenton Jones. How's Anne? Not as frisky as you remember her. Good girl. The last time we met, you were writing a book on Stonehenge, I believe. Was then. Still am. That's why you're here, Reeve. As soon as the minister thought of Stonehenge, he thought of you. Do you often think of uh, Stonehenge, minister, amid the many affairs of state? Well, it's become an affair of state, actually. It's quite a scheme. What scheme? Oh, it's an idea of mine. We're proposing to move it all up to London. I mean, it's, it, it's really very rational. Tourism's our second biggest industry now. 1,400 millions a year, but it's a cutthroat business. Live sex shows in Amsterdam, bogus masses in Baden-Baden. Our speciality is history, but history happens so randomly. I mean, it's scattered all over the place. Well, I am an historian, and terribly dense. Move it? Why? We'd like to move it all into the middle. Mm, to the center. I think the minister feels that Stonehenge is rather vulnerable where it is. Why, do you see, the big threats are weather, erosion, and vandalism. For instance, a few years ago, some military cadets tried to heave the whole thing up with a gun carrier. 1965, to be precise. Mm -hmm. Yes, I believe so. Anyway, my idea is to put up an exact fiberglass replica on Salisbury Plain and move the original to Hyde Park, where we can keep a better eye on it. Protect it, preserve its character. I suppose you could surround it with Loch Ness and replace the monster with an inflatable model. <laughs> that's, that's very good, I like that. Of course, I did anticipate your skepticism, but it's not a new idea, you know. Oh, no. You know, one of its previous owners threatened to sell it to the United States earlier this century. Reeves the expert, true or false? Yes, yes, that's so. Aren't you rather underestimating the resistance you'll encounter elsewhere? Oh, the 
historical consolationism, the Celtic nationalists will kick up a bit of a fuss, no doubt. But after all, you don't mind having Cleopatra's needle in London, do you? And it will allow your archaeology chaps to dig all over the Stonehenge mound to their heart's content. Seems to me, gentlemen, that the minister's got a good point there. Let me put my cards on the table. We need your advice to get this move right. We want to do it precisely, scientifically, keep the astronomical axes, that sort of thing. Well, there'll be trouble, isn't it? Just from a few conservationists and scholars, I'm afraid. Oh, my dear Paul, you're not threatening me with the ancestral curse, I hope. Hmm? The Druid's revenge. Well, the Druid thing is very suspect. The whole thing is surrounded with invention, fiction. I mean, it's been everything from a, from a Roman temple to a launch pad for prehistoric spaceships. You scholars have had a wonderful time. Now, for heaven's sake, let's put the damn thing to some use. We've certainly never known what it's for in the past. We assume it's the product of a primitive civilization. Those people in 1800 BC moved stones weighing four or five tons with their own hands and directed them so precisely you can locate star systems to within quarter of a degree. And that is a system that can work only where it is. Now, it's entirely possible the whole thing has a magnetic field that has in some mysterious way influenced the development of our culture and has shaped worship and knowledge, even influenced the acts of individuals. And for all we know, still does. Dinner's nearly ready. What's that, Ram? Oh, it's just a thing I'm doing. Well, wash yourself, and we'll eat. You see, Harvey, I don't approve. Now, where are you taking us? Is everything up for sale now? It's a question of survival. Yes, I agree. Our survival is a country with a sense of values. Well, if you want to see us drop to the 20th possession in the league table of national no, growth, I don't think I'd I'm not care. We're several notches below Albania. Just so long as we don't prostitute ourselves for euro dollars or Libyan dinars, or whatever else it is you expect to get for this desecration. I'm afraid you suffer from the Oxford disease, not enough contact with the outside world. But what Too is... much clarity, dear boy. Not enough clarity. <laughs> but what is the real world? Is religion real or the past? What does reality consist of? Are we sure the ground we walk on is as solid as we think it is? I'm coming, Vanessa. Face washed, teeth clean. Vanessa, what are you doing? Is that one of Daddy's books? You know you're not supposed to touch them. You'd better put it back, hadn't you? You know, I do wish you wouldn't take all this so much to heart. I mean, why all this fuss about stone artifacts? I mean, they're always being moved. The Mexicans moved the great rain god to Mexico City. And it rained for days, if I remember rightly. A not an unaccustomed hardship for the British. <laughs> yes, and the Irish did it. Oh, yes. They moved the Turo stone from Galway to Dublin for an exhibition. Yes, and the sling broke, the stone fell and bounced, and nearly crushed the head of the Irish tourist board. Dear Nicholas, you really are trying to tell me something, aren't you? Surely you're not a man to leave any uh, stone unturned, mister. <laughs> Stones and curses go together. In 1899, the owner tried to sell it for grazing land. And he was turned into a toad. <laughs> no. On the turn of the year, one of the giant lintels fell. Very well. I shall stay in over the new year. There are curses, then. Rise up, stick, and stand still, stone. For king of England thou shalt be none. Thou and thy men whore stone shall be, and I myself an elden tree. Charming. It's a curse. From near here, actually. You know the roll-ride stones out Banbury Way? Mm. 
Well, they're reputed to be the petrified bodies of a pretender king of England and his men. The witch uttered that particular curse. And there they were, lumps of rock. And of course, you, like a good academic, believe all this absolutely. I believe in it metaphorically. I mean, why are stones thought animate, almost human? Why are they associated with forces beyond our control? Why is a circle of stones a place of worship and ritual? You know, I'm surprised at you, Nicholas. You are a historian. This is all mumbo jumbo. I mean, can you find one scrap of evidence to prove that this isn't pure coincidence or gossip? I doubt it. Isn't it the point that one's provoked to a sense of mystery by these things where they are, not when they're somewhere else? Well, I must say, Oxford has a remarkable facility for living outside the real world. Well, someone has to keep a firm grasp on the inner centrals. Right. So you are going to move it? Banish Plump Jack and banish all the world. I do, I will. End of the month, actually. Sean? Pierre, Sean, Pierre. What is it, John? Sean. Is that a friend from school? No. Come on. It's late. I want you fast asleep before Daddy comes home. Fenton Jones. Vanessa, what are you doing up at this hour? Why don't you... Mm. Come on, Morton, you are a linguist. What is it? Book without a cover. On the spine. Scribble? Couldn't it be a language? Not one I know, not in symbols I recognize. Divers strange characters, an unknown language or alphabet. Sit down, Reeve. Take the weight off your feet. Let me give you a glass of rather bad sherry. You're not the only one, you know. What do you mean? Well, most of the people I know who don't think they've discovered buried treasure or the troubled helix think they've discovered a language, you know, ladies at dinner parties, vicars at garden parties, they want me to decode it. The fact that people have gone blind or spent 20 years of their lives trying to decipher languages does not deter them. They're happy to have me take the risk. Well, you think it's not a language? 
Well, it could be anything, couldn't it? Scribble, personal cipher, child's drawing. What do you think a language is? Well, a system of speech and writing. A written language is a system of signs agreed and codified by a group of people in a given culture who have things they wish to exchange with each other. Now, who, when, and where is exchanging which with whom, about what, and why? The book itself is about Stonehenge. You surprise me. And it discusses the missing Stonehenge language. Well, that's the traditional idea, of course. Language is carried on stones. All right. Celtic languages did turn up in the... Middle Ages, but uh, this is uh, 17th century, isn't it? 1665. Mm. Plague and fire. Rather a bad year to publish. They all are. Much the same when my books come out. All right, 17th century loved cipher games, although this isn't in a familiar style, but why should a 3,000-year-old language turn up then? Well, this was the year of the Stonehenge controversy. Inigo Jones had just published his great book to demonstrate it was a Roman temple. Everyone got into it. Research all over the place. This man was interested in the mystical line. Hmm, scholar antiquary. He said Stonehenge was a language of strangers. He also spoke of the curse. That's why I looked at the book late last night after talking to our visitor. Not surprised, wouldn't it? Appalling man. He'd like to give fascism a bad name. You see, he's splashed all over today's papers. I never really read them. You ought to keep up with what's going on. He announced the scheme to the press yesterday. I thought he was consulting us first. Oh, you know, politicians act first, consult people afterwards. Well, what do they say? What you'd expect, really, the Telegraph's against it, Times is for it, and the Guardian, while strongly opposing the scheme on the one hand, warmly applauds it on the other. That's the uh, sun over there. Stonehenge move, which is protest. They've discovered a coven in Slough, putting on a black mass in the shed. I suppose you'll be off down there. You do uh, dance, don't you? You stick pins in a bloody man. Well, thank God you and I are rational, Reeve. So you went to the book, took the cover off, and there was the language. Well, the cover came off rather oddly. Look, can't you try it on one of your language computers? Well, they're clever, Reeve, but they're not that clever. There's not enough of it, really, you see. And, uh, no cultural background, context of utterance, as we say. And the alphabet's not familiar. I mean, that could be Greek or Chinese, and that's a bit Egyptian, but it uh, could be a code, but no repetition, you see. That makes it difficult to break. I need more of it, really. Well, as a matter of fact, it's one of a three-volume set. I bought in an antiquarian booksellers in Banbury ten years ago. Have you got the other two? No, they split the set to make the asking price. Rather unusual with a rare book. Well, it was lucky for me. I could only afford the one. But I probably could chase the others. Well, surely there are other sets. Well, there's only one other on record in the British Museum. Nicholas? Is that you? Yes, and I'm home. You're early. Harvey phoned. Who? While you were out, Harvey Fenton Jones. Oh, did he? He was absolutely charming. Well, that's an improvement. I didn't know he wanted you to serve on a committee to help the government move Stonehenge. I'm not going to. I happen to disapprove very strongly of the whole thing. I see. Oh, by the way, I'm going up to London tomorrow for the BM. Will you be back in time for dinner? I'll try to be. Well, I'm going for a walk with Vanessa. Uh, you're proposing that we remove the cover of a 17th century book. Yes. With the object of discovering whether words in another language are written on the spine. Exactly. Uh, uh, Dr. Reeve, what would we do if everyone came in here with requests like this? Well, it's hardly likely, is it? I admit it's an unusual request. Uh, there's nothing unusual about an unusual request. Happily, to guide us, there are regulations which directly forbid it. Well, I hardly expected there'd be regulations positively advocating taking covers or valuable books, but can't you make an individual decision? I am a scholar, Dr. Reeve, but I'm also a public official. Regulations are precisely designed to protect us from individual decisions. That's what it's all about. I'm sorry, Dr. Reeve, good day.
have your reader's ticket, Dr. Reed. I expect never to see you in here again. You're also open to proceedings. I'm sorry, I just had to know. Was there a language on the book? No. No, there wasn't. So, you ripped the back off a priceless book at the British Museum. Were they pleased? They took away my ticket. And that surprised you? They can see you as well. Oh, that should do wonders for your scholarly reputation. Nicholas, do you think the... Well, do you think that you're normal, in the sense that other people are normal? Well, I seem normal to me. It's my Elizabeth David book. Who? My cookery book. Huh. I mean, you've no time for your family. You pass up the chance of a post that would give you some standing in the world. And now you tear up a national treasure. You wouldn't have done a thing like that when we were first married, not conceivably. If one of your students behaved like that with an old book, you'd be shot beyond belief, wouldn't you? Yes. But you're different. And my book. Someone's taken my book. Oh, not again. But where is it? Where you put it. No, it's not. It's gone. Well, perhaps it's just as well. Did you take it? Why should I? To discourage me. No, Nick, I didn't. How could it go? Has Vanessa been in here today? She's always in and out. Is she in bed? Oh, Nick, don't wake her. Just disappear. Oh, I'll leave it till tomorrow. I have to go to Banbury tomorrow to see my book somewhere. Is this still about your ridiculous language? Yes, I want to find the other two books in the set. Do you ever think about staying here and seeing a student or two? I do see them. Oh, it's ridiculous. unfaithful to me with that bloody book. Never heard of Ogham? No, where is it? It's a language written on stones. Is this the one you think you found? It could be. I really don't know. Oh, that's what I admire about you. Your compelling lucidity. Your triumphant rationality. What a wondrous piece of work is a man. Well, that's what's so unexpected about this. It isn't conventionally Celtic at all. Right. And is there any sense in which, if you found it and translated it, it would make the slightest difference to ordinary, everyday human life and relationships? No. No.
I wonder if you could help me about a book. Is Mr. Snaith here? You're looking at my photograph. How old is it? Well, ageless, my dear sir, ageless. But one thinks it doesn't one of those uh, warm summers just before the Great War. It isn't for sale. Sentimental associations. I came about a book, one I bought at auction about ten years ago, on Stonehenge by an anonymous author. Oh, a scholar antiquary. Yes, I sold the three-volume set, a great rarity. You were fortunate to get it. How did you? A good source? Impeccable. I trust all's well with your acquisition. I recall it went for a fair price. I split the set. Wasn't that rather an outrageous thing to do for such a small profit? Profit was not my motive. The spread of learning, perhaps. I wanted the three volumes to go to individuals. You did nothing to the books. Rebind them. They were in their original bindings, as I recall. Though this, this was ten years ago. Oh, you're, you're doubtful about your volume. I'd happily rebuy at the same price. No, I want to trace the other two. I regret that the identity of the purchasers must remain sacrosanct. Well, I'd li like to link the volumes up again. You see, I'm engaged in research. I'm afraid in my experience, the word research tends to a curious elasticity. I could, on your commission, attempt to buy them back. I'm not in a position to purchase. If there's no purchase, there's no profit. I could pay you a small search fee. Ten pounds in cash. Very well. Then I'll get my record clerk to see if she can be of some assistance to uh, take a seat. She appears not to hear a word I said. Alas, a common characteristic of the deaf the world over. I'm sorry. Now then, what are we looking for? A stone hinge defended by a scholar antiquary. Yeah, one of many books on the subject, you know. Jones, Webb, Charlton. Yeah. Jones said the Romans built it, Webb the Danes, and Charlton they couldn't have since their hobbies were homicide, filicide, regicide, fratricide, matricide, and uh, patricide. A bad pedigree. Our scholar antiquary says that learned men came from elsewhere and built a stone language to speak to the gods. A remarkable book for its day. Ah, here we are. Items sold in August 1968. Oh, purchasers are Mr. Caradoc Hobbs. Oh, yes, I remember him. A Welshman, I think. A writer. He certainly affected the proletarian style like so many of our brighter luminaries. Yeah, uh, Mr. Nicholas Reeve. Distinguished, I recall. If a shade... Um, Effeminate. I'm Nicholas Reeve. Oh, gentle is actually the word I was groping for. Of course, you're Mr. Reeve. I have almost total recall. Uh, and the uh, third gentleman was from France, and Monsieur Lambotte. A medical person, I recollect. Do you have their addresses? <laughs> no. I just uh, since the postal code's a matter of esoteric scholarship. Would another search fee help? Five pounds? Very generous. I'll write them down. Oh, thank you. You're clearly uh, fascinated by Stonehenge. So are my clerk and myself. You've heard of the plan to uh, move it to London? Yes. Quite deplorable. Oh, never fear. There's been such talk before. In uh, 1915, the commanding officer of the nearby aerodrome said it got in the way of his takeoffs. He wanted it flattened. He died suddenly. No, it won't be moved. Very pretty. Granny? No, turn it over on the other side. Oh, I see, I see, I see. It's the same script. Very much the same, yes. In fact, this bit is what is written on the spine of your book, only transcribed horizontally rather than vertically. And all this bit's new. There you are, then. That's what you wanted, isn't it? 
Now, wait a minute, Reeve, wait a minute. Doesn't this worry you? Why should the language of Stonehenge Man be written in ordinary, rather faded commercial ink on the back of a photograph taken when? Well, I don't know, 1914? No, I mean, how did it get there? Well, perhaps I'm not the first. Someone else might have copied it from all three books. Ah, but that means someone has replaced the binding on your book since 1914. And that opens all sorts of doors. Such as? Well, a very cunning hoax. Some devious soul devises a bogus language, copies it off the back of this photograph onto all three volumes, puts the binding back, and then waits for some obliging scholar like you to come along and uncover the mystery. Took down skullduggery. But why should he bother to do that? I don't know, she had bloody mindedness. Academics are like that, you know, invent facts to fit theories rather than the other way around. It's our cardinal sin. Where did you get this, actually? Snave, the bookseller in Banbury. Could be him. Fortunately, there isn't a problem, because we can uh, check it, uh, at least to the nearest century. We can examine the spine of your book under a microscope and see if it was written with a quill pen. Metal nibs didn't really come in until 1748, and they weren't in general use for 100 years after that. The book's disappeared. What do you mean, disappeared? I don't know. I locked it in the drawer of my desk, and it's just gone. But Snaith did tell me when I could find the other two volumes. That's right. <laughs> Carruthers Hobbs! You're looking for me? You're very remote. <laughs> I've come to meet you. <laughs> Remote's a word used by suburbanites to describe people whose carbon monoxide level is below their own. Self-sufficient. Yeah. Have a drop of this. Thank you. Warm you up a bit. It's quite a walk. The cottage is up this way. You are hard to find. Oh, not really, not really. This is near uh, Pentra Ivan, isn't it? Pentra Ivan? Ah, yes, indeed. The village of Evan. You've not been to Wales before? I taught at Aberystwyth for a couple of years. Ah, very nice. Fine. When you rang and said you were looking for a lost language, I thought you must be a romantic, a poet. <laughs> I'm just an historian trying to solve a very important mystery. <laughs> But you don't solve mysteries, Dr. Reeve. You enter them. Like Robert Graves, the poet, you know. One day, he read the Mabinogion. Those are our ancient Welsh legends. And he realized they hid a message that was leading him somewhere. Do you know where it took him? No. Where you're going, to a language. The secret Celtic alphabets the Druids used. You mean Ogham? No, not Ogham. The secret tree alphabet, the consonants were months, the vowels were solstices. The secret worship alphabet, an organic alphabet. Not like our rational A, B, C, Q, E, D. Would you recognize this language if it was on the spine of your book? Ah, Dr. Eve, there we have a problem about the book. I realize it's priceless. Oh, I, I'm, I'm not properly bound. No. I, I, I'm out of all that sort of thing. No, it's, it's not that, I'm afraid. You see, I can't show you the book. Why not? I don't have it. But last night you said... Well, last night on the phone I wasn't drunk, you know. I, I thought I did have it. But this morning I went to the shelf and it disappeared. It was there two days ago. Oh, I'm sorry you've had this useless quest. I, I rang your home from the pub this morning and they said you'd already left. How did it disappear? I don't know. I don't lock doors. I, I don't need to. A few people come up here. The woman I lived with, she's left me. Well, I don't understand it. Look, uh, where are you staying? I booked a hotel at Fishguard. Why not stay up here with us? 
That's very good of you. With me and my daughter. Charles. What's the matter? Vanessa's has disappeared. Good evening, sir. I'm Detective Inspector Barrett. Mrs. Reed reported to us that your daughter left school two hours ago and hasn't been seen since. Two hours? Exactly. But I've just been explaining that this sort of thing does happen quite often. Children are always forgetting what time of day it is. I've telephoned everyone we know. She's never run off before? No. Never talked about it? No. Adventurous, is she? No, rather shy. But she's been behaving strangely lately. That's why I'm especially worried. How strangely, Mrs. Reed? Yes, but it's seven hours now. Yes, I, I'm sure you will. Thank you. Bye-bye. They've started a search. They'll circulate her photograph. That is, if she's not back. You know she won't be back. She's been taken. Come on, sit down. Keep calm. <laughs> Don't jump to conclusions. Oh, she's so little. I think she's gone of her own volition. But you told the inspector she'd been talking to herself. Now, what did she say? The, the other night in bed, she mentioned a name. Well, can you remember what it was? Sheila. Shane, I don't know. Sean? Yes. <laughs> I met her, Sean, yesterday in Wales. I took her to school down in the village. She stays for lunch. I went down in the evening and she wasn't there. She'd gone in the break, just walked away. Well, she's a bit unusual, I know. She, she's my daughter, so they, they weren't too terribly worried. And then after that, no trace at all. They, they've searched the mountain, they're used to that. Up to now, nothing. And then Dr. Reeve rang me. I, I came down here, I thought there must be some connection. But what possible connection? The girls don't know each other. How could they know each other? But they were aware of each other. Vanessa knew Sean's name. And Sean knew Vanessa. She talked about her. How could she? Well, it is possible, you know, psychokinesis. I mean, people can transmit between each other. There's, there's no doubt it's been demonstrated too often. It's a bit of a stage performance, isn't it? No, Inspector. The old rational code is dying. We're we are less ordinary than we think, and a lot of people are finding that out and expanding their consciousness. You really believe this? Of course! I knew Sean was psychokinetic. I've known for years, and I've encouraged her to develop her consciousness. To talk to Vanessa. But one knows there's contact. One, one sees intensified states. You really believe this? If you know all that, you'll know where they are. No, no I don't. I, 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 I'm, I'm as lost as you are. Mr. Hobbs, there's not much I can do about imaginary links between children. What I do need to know about are the real links between you. There are no links between us. Nothing. Dr. Reeve has just been to Wales. Mr. Hobbs is in this room. Well, that's because of the books. The books? It's a split three-volume set. We both bought a volume in Banbury. This is the book that went missing. Yes. Well, my copy's missing, too. Is it? Hmm. 
Are they valuable? Well, yes, to a scholar or a collector. Besides, there's something odd about them. Oh, Nicholas, for God's sake. What's odd about your book, Dr. Reeve? Mine has a language on it, written on the cover, on the spine. I thought Mr. Hobbs's copy might have it too. That's why I went to see him. Do you mean it's a, a code of some kind? Well, it depends what you mean by code. Nothing very dramatic. I think it's an ancient, undeciphered language. Probably one of the druid languages. There were a number, Inspector. Well, actually, that's arguable. Now, you say three books. Who has the third? Someone in Rennes, in France. I have his address. Can you let me have it? Yes. I'll make some inquiries. Wren. That's near Karnak. Near Karnak. It's an ancient avenue of stones. The forming of the triangle. Karnak. Pentry even. And Stonehenge.
casa? Hello. Who are you? What's your name? Is she really all right? Oh, Nick, thank God. Yes. Yes, I get her room ready. Get home as quickly as you can. Following the meeting, members from all parties agreed to reconvene in Geneva later this year. The death has just been reported of Mr. Harvey Fenton Jones, the recently appointed Minister of Tourism. The wreckage of his car was found late this afternoon by Hampshire police in a ditch on the A30 near Basingstoke. The minister had been thrown through the windscreen and died instantly. go together. One man who tried to sell it ended his days in a madhouse. The Air Force officer who wanted to move it flew into a hillside. And these stories go back. There's the peddler whose corpse was found right on the site, his head crushed by a stone fall. Then there are the barrows where Stonehenge blue stones are found inside the corpses. A magic power, a curse,